Hi, my name's Luann Kendall. I'm an acute care nurse practitioner and a doctorate of nursing. And I'm just really thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the art of managing seizures. Uh, I have no disclosures, just a little background about who I am. I've been a registered nurse for 37 years and an acute care nurse practitioner for about 22 of those years. And I have some various experience in internal medicine. I've been a hospitalist. I've worked in cardiology, CT surgery, and in outpatient and inpatient neurology. So let's get started. Just some statistics as we always start out these lectures. Um, one in 26 Americans develop epilepsy. And it's estimated that 3 million Americans and 65 million people worldwide currently live with epilepsy. Now I know we started to talk about seizures and here I am talking about epilepsy, but you can't talk about one without the other. And we're going to distinguish the two here in a minute. 2000 people are diagnosed with epilepsy each year and two thirds of the diagnosed epilepsy patients, the cause is unknown. Now this is really interesting because epilepsy affects more people than multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and Parkinson's disease combined. Yet the epileptics and seizure patients receive fewer federal dollars per patient than any of each of those I mentioned each year. It's estimated 50,000 deaths occur in the United States from status epilepticus. And SUDEP, which is sudden unexpected death from epilepsy, occurs for 34% of all sudden deaths in children. And lastly, epilepsy costs the US $15.5 billion each year. All right, so let's define the two because we talk about seizures, we talk about epilepsy, but there is a difference. So in seizure, that's where an individual occurrence of abnormal synchronized, now remember that word, synchronized electrical activity occurs in a part of the brain. And there are many causes of seizures and these causes are also known as provoked seizures. So remember that word, because we're gonna come back to it. Now, epilepsy is a little different. It's an abnormal neurologic condition in which you experience recurrent seizures. However, there's usually no known underlying cause and there is no provoked cause in epilepsy and there may be abnormal or unexplained synchronized electrical impulses in your brain. Now let's go on a little further. The ILAE, now you may hear this a lot and that stands for the International League Against Epilepsy. Now they go further to define this as in order to be diagnosed with epilepsy, you have to have at least two unprovoked. Now remember seizures, we talked about them being provoked. Two unprovoked seizures occurring greater than 24 hours apart or one unprovoked seizure and a probability of a further similar seizure of at least 60%. Now that's important. Or the diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome, which we see a lot in children like Dervais or Lennox-Gastaut. That's a lot. So hang on. Now this is something I always remember and it may make it simpler for you. You can have seizures without epilepsy, but you cannot have epilepsy without seizures. Now that's a little more simple to remember. Okay, for any of you starting out school back in the caveman days like I did, we had terms like Pettit Mall and Grand Mall, but those changed in 2017. And at first I was like, oh no, I can't even remember Pettit Mall and Grand Mall and now they've changed it. But once I got used to it, I realized they changed it to make it more descriptive and it's, it's really easier. So I'm gonna try to go over this a little bit with you. So there's basically three categories as you can see, there, see here, it's focal onset, focal which means one part of the body, generalized onset, and then unknown, which we just don't know what it is. So let's talk about focal. Underneath the focal category, a patient can be either aware or impaired aware, which means they're awake, but they're somewhat confused. So underneath that, you can have motor or non-motor. 
Now here's what's interesting about this. When you classify a seizure, it's focal onset. So you classify it according to what they showed at the onset of their seizure. And underneath motor, there's automatisms. And if you're familiar with that, automatisms are little motor uh, movements such as lip smacking, uh, chewing, fiddling with the fingers, um, atonic, which means kind of loss, loss of motor movement, clonic, which is this rhythmic jerky kind of thing, an epileptic spasm you see mainly in children, but it's kind of a, a truncal sort of movement, um, myoclonic. Now myoclonic differs from clonic where clonic is rhythmic and myoclonic is an arrhythmic or abnormal jerky kind of movement. And then there's the non-motor, which is um, autonomic, autonomic symptoms, which mean like kind of a gastric sort of thing. Um, people feel like their stomach is moving up. They experience nausea, vomiting. So that's all underneath focal. Now underneath general, you have tonic-clonic, and tonic is the freezing up, clonic is this movement, and under general, patients lose consciousness. Myoclonic is the non-rhythmic, um, atonic is loss of muscle tone, and epileptic spasms is very unusual. Like I said, again, we see this most in children, but it's kind of a spasm of the truncal region. And then unknown onset, let's say you didn't see when it happened. You didn't see the onset, so you have to classify that as unknown. All right, so let's break it down. We're going to talk about there are three types of focal seizures. So you can remember three. They're either aware, so they're fully awake, they know what's going on. They're impaired aware, which means they're confused, but they're still awake. And then you have the focal to bilateral tonic-clonic, which means they're awake, and then they kind of fade out and go into a tonic-clonic seizure, which is a generalized seizure. Now I have a picture here of a gentleman who's doing this and his arms up like this. And the reason I have that is this is called a figure of four. And so when someone goes from focal to bilateral tonic-clonic, in 92% of people, and you've probably seen this but didn't know what to make of it, they will um, raise their arm up on the contralateral side of where the seizure begins. So contralateral means opposite. Say they started to have focal seizure activity here on the left. They will raise their right arm with their finch cl fist clenched and the ipsilateral, same side, their hand will go across like this. And this is called a figure of four. And you can see this as they're going from focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizure. Um, I kind of, this is, I'm being silly, but it's a way to help you remember. Remember the flamenco dancers where they kind of do this, you know, sometimes they have a rose in their mouth. It's the same kind of movement. And you will see that 92% of the time, just as they're going into the tonic phase of their generalized tonic clonic seizure. So it's kind of a giveaway sign to let you know, hey, we're going into a generalized seizure. All right. We're going to move on. So then there are six main types of generalized seizures. So, um, so we had three types of focal and we have six types, I can't even count, six types of generalized seizures. There's your tonic. Tonic is the stiffening, stiff like a board. Clonic, tonic clonic. So now you got three of them right there. Myoclonic, and myoclonic is the, the jerking, the arrhythmic jerking. Atonic, which is loss of tone. And that's kind of rare, you don't see that very much. And then absence, which you see mainly in kids. And that's the kind of seizure where, in fact, I saw one kid in my, my daughter's class in kindergarten and he would stare off into space and he wasn't doing well in school. And his teacher said he just daydreams all the time. And I looked at him and I said, you know, I think he's having seizure activity. And sure enough, he was having absence seizures. They don't necessarily have a post-ictal phase, but they may stare off into space and then they kind of come too. And that's an absence, it's a generalized seizure. 
So there are your six types of generalized seizures. Okay, so we talked about these seizures and there are kind of rules for classifying them. You don't have to memorize these, but they're just kind of bear with me, they're general rules. So ask yourself, are they awake? Are they awake and impaired? So that would mean it's focal or are they totally out of it, which is general. All right, so if they're awake, are they alert or are they alert and impaired? This is really important, the onset of the seizure. Uh, if it was seen, you have to say, was it focal or general? And if you didn't see it or don't know, you classify it as an unknown. Now, I have not seen a behavioral arrest seizure, but I'm sure there are, and they've been reported to be. If it's a focal behavior arrest, the behavior has to be the main feature and it has to occur during the entire seizure. Focal seizures, are they motor or non-motor? Um, this is splitting hairs here, bilateral versus general. Bilateral seizures start in one hemisphere and then move to the other. A general seizure starts in both. So um, then clonic versus myoclonic, and we spoke about this. Clonic is rhythmic jerking. Myoclonic is sort of a non-rhythmic jerking. Okay, so are you guys ready? Let's do a case study. Uh, it's not really a case study, but let's do, can you classify this seizure? So here we go. I'm gonna give you a little case here. A 25 year old woman describes a seizure beginning with an intense feeling of familiar music playing. It lasts approximately 40 seconds and then it resolves. Once it's over, she can recall hearing people talking in the background. So we know that she's awake. Okay, so this is not generalized, it's focal, right? But she's unable to determine what they were saying and she's a little drowsy and confused. So is she awake or is she impaired? I would say it's focal impaired, but she kind of reorients herself in 15 to 20 minutes. All right, so let's classify this seizure. So it's not general, it's focal, and it's impaired aware. Now that was pretty easy. I, see, you guys can do this. All right, let's try one more. Can you classify this seizure? A 25 year old male has a seizure beginning with a few non-rhythmic, okay, so this is rhythmic, that's clonic. Non-rhythmic is what? Myoclonic, okay, so myoclonic followed by stiffening of all limbs. So we know when they stiffen up, that's tonic. And then he has rhythmic jerking on the left side. So we've got myoclonic, tonic, clonic, and it lasts 35 seconds and then he's unconscious. So this is probably not a focal seizure. We've got that. So this is a generalized. Stertorous breathing is noted. Now, if any of you know what that means, stertorous breathing is the loud, noisy breathing that you hear after someone's had a seizure. It's that, that real noisy, I am not awake, I am totally out breathing. So um, that's what we call that noisy breathing when someone's post-ictal, it's called stertorous. He wakens in one hour and he's confused. Here we go. The answer, it's generalized, we know that, because he's out of it, myoclonic, tonic-clonic seizure. You guys have got this, it's not that tough. All right. Now, um, like I said, this is an art form. There's no exact science with this, but as you know, say you're working in a clinic, someone comes in and they said they had a seizure or a spell. There's some things that are seizure mimics and one of them is syncope. So let's talk about seizure versus syncope. And I've got a nice um, comparison chart here. So with seizures, they can have a seizure at nighttime, they can have a seizure standing up, sitting down, but syncope usually occurs 
when somebody goes from a position of lying to standing or sitting to standing because they have a drop in blood pressure orthostasis. Seizures during an attack, if they get hypoxic, they have blue lips. Syncope, uh, they're usually pale, clammy, sometimes sweaty. Seizures, if they have tonic-clonic, there's usually that stiffening and then a little bit of jerking. Now I have seen syncopal patients, one in particular, I was showing someone an MRI and their family member, they couldn't handle anything medical. They passed out on the ground and I saw a few brief jerks and they urinated on themselves and they were out. So um, syncopal patients can urinate on themselves. They can have a few little jerks. Um, so that can happen with syncope, but Urinary incontinence is common with seizures, but you can have it with syncope. Um, usually seizure patients are disoriented afterwards. Syncopal patients have a quick recovery. With seizures, tongue biting can happen, but usually the tongue biting is on the side of the tongue. Um, seizure patients can have injuries. They can have rib fractures. They can have shoulder dislocations, which is usually a posterior shoulder dislocations. So, those are some things that can help you differentiate. The other thing that we need to differentiate is PNES, which stands for psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Sometimes we call those pseudo seizures. Um, I prefer the term PNES. Now for a long time, um, when I first started working neurology, I thought, Maybe this is put on, it's attention seeking, but it's not. It's purely something somatic. These people don't put this on for attention. It's, it's something that can happen. It's a way of them expressing their severe anxiety. Um, so here's a nice table that can help you out. Um, a lot of times PNES is induced by anxiety, stress or confrontation. It, their seizure can wax and wane. You may see them have these wild, bizarre movements. It slows down, it goes back again, and it can last a long time. And we know a true seizure will only last maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds. A lot of times PNES will happen in the physician's office, in the lobby, at the CT scanner. Um, it worsens when there's witnesses in the room. Um, crying, whispering, study, stuttering can happen. Uh, with a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Um, a lot of pelvic thrusting, usually their eyes are closed. Um, this kind of head shaking movement, pelvic thrusting, um, they can be incontinent at times, but an ictal cry is one thing that you will see usually only with a to generalized tonic clonic seizure because once the body is stiffened and you have that muscular stiffening, um, air will be pushed out of the lungs, it goes past the vocal cords and you hear this, this ictal cry. And if you've never heard it, I want you to Google it or look it up on YouTube, it's very distinctive. So these are some things that can help you differentiate between PNES versus seizure. Sometimes it's hard for neurologists to differentiate this and sometimes we have to put them in a video monitoring unit in order to really determine the etiology. And they're treated very differently. Okay, next question. Do you treat a first time seizure or provoke seizure? Um, usually we say no, but sometimes it depends. So there's no exact rules um, and we'll go over this. What is a provoked seizure? A seizure has a physical cause or known cause. And usually treatment is focused on addressing the underlying cause or the event. So here are some causes. Number one cause for a provoked seizure, and we probably all know this, is non-compliance with seizure medications. So you gotta really ask your patient, when was the last time you took your medicine? Are you complying about taking your medicine? When are you supposed to take your medicine? Do you see somebody for it? Have you had levels drawn? Um, electrolyte imbalances, hypoglycemia, another thing you gotta always check. Say you're working in the emergency room and they come in and seize. Check their 
their blood sugar levels, check their sodium levels. There are a lot of seizure medicines out there that can lower sodium levels. Check their calcium. Um, certain antidepressants, certain antipsychotics, stimulants, and even antibiotics can lower the seizure threshold. Um, always check an alcohol level. If they've been on benzodiazepines and they quit them suddenly, that can certainly cause seizures. Are they on stimulants? Um, are they withdrawing from alcohol? Uh, did they quit taking their seizure medicine suddenly? Sepsis, CNS infections, traumatic brain injury, stroke. Um, do they have a tumor? Autoimmune diseases, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Any of you guys have seen that movie, Brain on Fire? It's an excellent movie to see. Um, I recommend seeing it. Um, do they have lupus cerebritis? And, you know, I don't know. Some people classify this as a cause for provoked seizures. But if you're sleep deprived, um, if you have seizures and you're sleep deprived, that certainly could provoke it. <clears throat> All right, here's a question for you. Which of the following medications is least likely to lower the seizure threshold? So all of these can lower the seizure threshold except one. Bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, Levofloxacin or Levaquin, Tramadol, Altram, and I have a hard time pronouncing this, but it's Benadryl, which is number D, um, Zyrtec, and Emipenin or Meropenin. So look those over and see what you think. And the answer is E, Zyrtec, which is an antihistamine. Um, and we'll go back, uh, di, I can't pronounce that, but we'll say Benadryl. Benadryl can actually lower the seizure threshold. So other medications, uh, clozapine, uh, lithium, Demerol, Theophylline, Tacrolimus, any of the fluoroquinolones, Cipro, Levaquin, Flagyl, and some of the TB meds, all can lower your seizure threshold. So ask your seizure patient to always call you or ask you or check with the pharmacist when they're placed on any other medications. Okay, case study, here we go. All right, hang on, we're gonna talk about this. You're working in the ER, let's pretend. And here's the case. A 35 year old male was brought to your emergency room by EMS with the initial diagnosis of loss of consciousness and possible seizure. He was driving and found in his car at a stoplight unresponsive and breathing heavily with stertorous breathing, we'll say that. The driver behind him was blowing his horn and blowing his horn. Everybody was blowing their horn and the car wouldn't move. So the driver behind him finally got out of his car and found this man unresponsive. So he called the EMS. The patient's wife was notified and she is on her way to the hospital, but she's not there yet. The patient arrives and is placed in your room. Lucky you. Okay, the patient's vital signs are stable. He is awakening, but his awareness is impaired. What do you do first? And clocking out is not an answer. Going to lunch is not an answer. So here we go. He's in your room. You've got your vital signs. You do a neuro exam, a physical exam. Um, he's starting to talk to you. He definitely has amnesia after the event. There's no focal deficits. Um, you're gonna look for tongue biting. And where would you find it most likely? Would it be at the tip of the tongue if he had seizure? It'd most likely be at the sides of the tongue, although I have seen it at the tip of the tongue. You're gonna look for any injuries, which would be rib fractures. Um, if he was falling on the floor, you might see posterior shoulder dislocation. So some things you're gonna to wanna to get, a bedside EEG, an MRI of the brain, CBC, CMP, urine and serum drug screen, alcohol level. And this is controversial. We used to always order a prolactin level and a CPK. 
And history is so important. The most important thing you can get is a history, but you're not going to get a good one from him right now, and his wife is not there. So, patient history. Um, most oftentimes, you won't get a good history from the patient since they're the one that they're the ones that had the seizure. So, some things I have learned along the way while getting a history, you can't lead the patient into the answers. Like, for example. You can't say, were you really drowsy afterwards? You might want to say, what's one of the first things you remember um, after the event? Now, if they say, I woke up and there were all these people standing over me, you can realize that his postictal time was pretty short. Or if he says, um, I remember being in the hospital room and maybe that was a day later, then you know that he had a long post-ictal time. Um, when patients describe things as a spell, some things you gotta think about, as we mentioned earlier, syncope, maybe a migraine, sleep disorder. There are other things you gotta think about. And like I said, again, not all seizure patients bite their tongue or incontinent. Um, more reliable signs, I always think one of the most reliable signs is were they drowsy afterwards? How long were they drowsy? Were they postictal? Tongue biting on the side of the tongue? Did anyone witness an ictal cry? Did they have stertorous breathing postictal? Those are all important signs. You do your physical exam, note any focal deficits. Um, if you have a patient that has intermittent alteration in consciousness and you suspect a seizure, uh, it's always good to put an EEG on them, a continuous EEG. I've had several patients who had subclinical static, status epilepticus and it wasn't picked up. So that's always something to think about. Okay, we talked about tests to order. Um, an MRI is always preferable if you can't get a CT because we're looking for structural problems. Um, we talked about lab tests. Get a CBC with a diff because you want to see if there's any sign of infection. Prolactin level, we used to do that a lot in the 80s. Um, prolactin is secreted by the pituitary gland. It can be elevated 20 to 30 minutes after a seizure, um, sometimes two to three times elevated, normal is around 20. But other things that can elevate a prolactin level are pregnancy, a tumor, anorexia, medications such as uh, Reglan and some of the atypical antipsychotics. Um, CPK is very nonspecific. It's elevated if you have any type of skeletal muscle trauma, even cardiac trauma. So those aren't always reliable. Check a serum and urine drug screen. And if you think there's any infectious process, you might want to consider an LP. Okay, so I'm going to grab a drink here. Your exam revealed regular vital signs. They were fine. Neuro exam was normal. Physical exam was normal. Labs were normal. And of course, the MRI machine was down. It's always the way at my hospital. CT of the head was normal. The tech called in so you couldn't get an EEG. What do you know? So what you would do is schedule one on an outpatient basis with a neurologist. And the best one to get is always a sleep deprived EEG. So the wife finally gets there and she verifies that he had a traumatic brain injury last year. And she suspects that he has had several nighttime or nocturnal seizures. Hmm, those are things to think about. So are we gonna treat this guy? Well, you know, I would treat this guy. It is a first time reported seizure. However, he has a history of traumatic brain injury and he's had possible two nocturnal seizures. So if he was in my emergency room, I would not want to send him out without treatment and I would send him to a neurologist for evaluation and for that sleep deprived EEG. So let's treat him with a medication. And you're gonna to have to educate the patient on the medication and about seizures, about safety measuring, measures, no driving. And I would schedule a follow-up I would also want that MRI because we didn't get one there. And um, that's what I would do. So as you can see, you may find people that wouldn't, but I certainly would with this history. Okay. 
Now, considerations when choosing a seizure medicine. Is it the appropriate medicine? What are the adverse effects? What about dosing and metabolism? Pharmacodynamics, which is medication mechanism of action, pregnancy considerations, and big thing is cost. All right, so we're almost there, but I do wanna talk about medicines a little bit because even though you may not work neurology, everyone is gonna have a seizure patient coming in and out of their doors. It's a given, it's very common. So there are three main categories of drugs. There is your glutamate mediated, your GABA mediated, and your sodium channel inhibitors or voltage gated. So now this is a lot. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize this, but I want you to know a little bit about how these medications work. Under the glutamate mediated, we have some direct calcium channel blockers. Now, these drugs, a lot of them have several different mechanisms of action. So one of the big medicines that we use is topiramate, topamax. This is also a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and its cousin, zanisamide or zonogram also is. And did you know that we can use magnesium for seizures? Um, there's also gabapentin and Lyrica. And then another big medicine that we use is levetiracetam, which is Keppra. And that's an SV2A binder. And brivetiracetam or Briviac, which is a newer medicine, is an SV2A binder. And the reason I want you to know these medicines and what category they are is if you have to treat a patient with more than one medicine, I would pick a medicine from two different categories because they work differently. And so they work more synergistically. Um, you don't wanna pick two sodium medicines. Um, you wanna pick one from different categories. Then you've got your GABA mediated medicines, which include the benzodiazepines, phenobarbital, sodium valproate. Now you'll find sodium valproate or Depakote works from a lot of different mechanisms. You've got clobazam, which is Onfi, and Vigabatrin, or Sabro. Now, I'm gonna go through these real quick. I don't expect you to memorize these, but I want you to know kind of what classes they're in. Probably some of your most common drugs that you've heard of are the sodium channel blockers, phenytoin dilantin, carbamazepine, tegretol, oxcarmazepine, trileptal, and eslicarmazepine, which is a newer one, which is aptium. Then you have lamictal, uh, lamotrigine, sodium valproate, depakote, and then lacosamide, vimpat. Now it's kind of in the same category, but it works a little different because it delays the inactivation of sodium channels. All right, now this is real important. So we remembered we had six types of generalized seizures. Do you remember that? So that was tonic, clonic, tonic-clonic, myoclonic, atonic, and absence. Now, for absence seizures, it's just tried and true that we put them on, and now I'm having a brain fart. We put them on, uh, I'll get back to that, but there's one medication that we use for that. Exosomide, uh, anyway, I don't use it because we usually treat that for children, but I will get back with you on that. So for generalized seizures, there are only certain medicines that we use. You don't have to remember all of these, but some of the big hitters are, Briviac is kind of new on the scene. And a lot of people say it's a me too medicine for uh, levetiracetam. They're both SVO2 agents. But Brivirac, um, or Brivaracetam is a really good medicine. It is expensive, but it's one to think about. Um, people tolerate it very well. Depakote is one. You have to be careful using that in women of childbearing age because it has um, estrogenic side effects for the fetus. Lamictal is a good one for pregnant women. Um, you have to titrate it slow and it does interact with a lot of things can cause a bad skin rash. Keppra, I think people use that a lot. It's a good medicine, but 
Um, it does have some psychiatric side effects, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, topiramate or Topamax, we use a fair amount, mainly for migraines, but it is an excellent drug for generalized seizures. Focal seizures. Now, the number one recommended agent for focal seizures is carmazepine, which is Tegretol. Um, it does have side effects. It can lower your sodium levels. It can cause a bad skin rash, but it is the number one recommended drug. You have to be careful in using it in the Asian population. Um, Oxcarmazepine, which is trileptal, also is a, a fairly good drug. You have to watch sodium levels. But then you've got a lot of your big hitters um, that you use for generalized seizures in this list also. Okay, so let's talk specifics. Anti-seizure meds, now you notice I didn't say AED, anti-epileptic drugs. The newer term is anti-seizure meds, um, but they're, they're used interchangeably. Okay, this is important. Anti-seizure meds that affect birth control because you're gonna have a lot of women on birth control and mainly I'm talking about estrogen. Okay, I'd categorized it into three Ps, phenobarbital, phenotoid, and phenotoin and parampanil, which is ficumpa, and parampamil in higher doses. Then there's their three Ts, which is tegretol, trileptal, and topamax in higher doses above 200 milligrams. And what they do is they induce hepatic metabolism of estrogen. So it decreases the effectiveness of your birth control. Sorry, I have a border collie here. And then there's Lamictal. We'll talk about Lamictal. Anti-seizure meds that have potential side effects, negative side effects, psychiatric side effects. Levetiracetam, Lamictal. Uh, my saying is, uh, not Lamictal, Keppra. My saying is that Keppra can flip the bitch switch in approximately 20% of your patient. So if you have a patient that has known history of depression, bipolar disease, this is not the best medicine for them. Another one is also zanisamide or Zonagran. Anti-seizure medicines that are utilized for mood stabilization. Okay, so just the opposite. You have a patient that is moody, they have bipolar disorder, depression, a good one for them would be sodium valproate, uh, lamotrigine or lamictal. Carbamazepine and oxcarmazepine are also utilized for uh, mood disorders. Here we go, anti-seizure meds used to treat migraines. Uh, a big one, sodium valproate or Depakote and topiramate. Lamotrigine is indicated for that. It has a clinical indication, although I haven't used it much in migraines. Ooh, another one to remember. Anti-seizure medicines that can cause a skin rash. Lamotrigine, it can cause Steven Johnson syndrome. So, and how it happens too, you've gotta to be real careful with Lamictal, you have to start low and go slow. But here's the big thing. If you stop Lamictal for whatever reason, you cannot restart it at the previous dose because it's starting lamictal at high doses that really cause a rash. You have to start back at the beginning. Uh, that's really important to know. Carbamazepine can cause a drug-induced rash and also phenytoin. Okay, so here's the puzzled look. Understanding lamictal. It is metabolized through a process in the liver called glucuronidation. That's a tongue twister. What, what I really want you to remember is there are liver enzyme inducers, carbamazepine, phenytoin, also estrogen, that can increase the metabolism of lamotrigine and decrease its effectiveness by 50% within one week. So, if you're gonna start somebody on Lamictal and they're already on carbamazepine or phenytoin, you have to be careful when mixing it with Lamictal. And Lamictal comes in three different starter packs. So there's a blue one, a green one, and an orange one. And I have to write this down because I sometimes forget. So 
Um, and I don't even know if they utilize these starter packs anymore, but just remember that um, carmazepine, phenytoin, and estrogen can decrease your lamictal level. So you have to give them more lamictal and it can decrease it very quickly by 50%. All right. Um, we won't talk about pregnancy and lamictal at this point, that's a whole nother lecture. But lamictal has a certain effect with Depakote or sodium valproate. So if you're gonna start lamictal and sodium valproate together, um, sodium valproate is a liver enzyme inhibitor. So Depakote will increase the level of lamictal, which can actually work to your advantage. So you can use less lamictal and get the same effect. And it can happen quickly. So there is a starter pack, um, which is a blue starter pack. The other one was green, this one's blue. And so it can happen quickly. So you use a lot less lamictal to achieve the same level if you're using it with Depakote. Um, again, we talked about lamictal causing a severe rash. All right, one last case study. Here we go. So you have a 30 year old female with a history of depression who has witnessed, now keep in mind, she's got a history of depression. She was witnessed having a generalized tonic clonic seizure activity. So she's out when she becomes coherent. She mentions that she has been on Depakote. So here we go. We've got Lamictal and Depakote and she ran out of her Depakote two days ago. What are we gonna do? We well, say, oh, that's easy. Let's just, just bag Depakote. Um, she's female, she's fertile, and Depakote has really bad side effects in case she gets pregnant. Now let's take her off of Depakote. Well, that's easy. So what are we gonna put her on? Well, let's put her on Levetiracetam, Keppra. Everybody puts them on Keppra. Well, she has a history of depression, right? So Keppra, and depression, Capra can flip the bitch switch. That's probably not the best medicine for her. So we could put her on Briviac, but that's an expensive medicine. I love Briviac, it's a great medicine. But probably a better choice for her would be Lamotrigine or Lamictal. Okay, so we put her on Lamictal. She's still got some Depakote on board. And what happens when we put Lamictal with Depakote? Well, we got to put her on a very small dose of Lamictal because Depakote and Lamictal, it causes the Lamictal level to go up really quick. So what color starter pack might we want to think about using with her? Um, first of all, it's known she has seizures and she'll need to be placed on an anti-seizure medicine. Childbearing age, Depakote is associated with severe birth defects. Levetiracetam or Keppra is not a good choice for depression. Lamotrigine is a good choice, but caution when mixing with Depakote. So I would start her out low and go slow and put her on that blue starter pack if they still make those. And we have to monitor her levels closely. So once the Depakote gets out of her system, her level is going to be low and we're going to have to bump it up. And always, always, if you've got a lady who is on anti-seizure medicine, I would certainly recommend placing her on folic acid, anywhere from one to about four milligrams a day. Okay, you guys are doing great. I'm almost done. Patient education is a must. If someone has seizures, uh, in most states, there is no driving until they are seizure-free for six months on their seizure medicines no swimming or bathing alone. Also another tip, um, make sure that they test the water in their shower before getting in. They can have a seizure, the shower can be hot, they can burn themselves. No rock climbing, hang gliding or F1 racing. They must be compliant with their medication. Um, there was a long time ago, we used to insist on brand name medicines only because sometimes the generics, it would fluctuate their levels and some patients are very sensitive and they could seize. Um, now, I don't think it's as, as urgent, but what I tell patients is if you're gonna use generic medicine, make sure you tell your pharmacist you wanna use the same generic brand. 
Uh, if you're female and fertile, you must call the office when you're placed on birth control. Even the Mirena um, IUD, that's estrogen. Um, I tell patients if they're gonna use an IUD, make sure it's progesterone. Um, if you become pregnant, you must call the office immediately. And lastly, I educate the patient on SUDEP. SUDEP, sudden unexpected death with epilepsy. Um, a person with epilepsy can die unexpectedly, unexpectedly even if um, they previously were in a good state of health. People with poorly controlled epilepsy are at highest risk. People who have absence or myoclonic seizures are not known to have an increased risk. Those at greatest risk are those with generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Most often, SUDEP occurs at night or during the sleep. Educate your patient on getting rest, taking medications as prescribed, avoiding alcohol or drugs, and following up with a neurologist if their seizures are not under control. Well, uh, that's all I have to say for today. It has been a pleasure uh, talking with you. If you have any questions, concerns, you can reach me at my email, which I've listed down here. And most of all, I wanna encourage you to please uh, refer to APP to APP for further lectures. We have some great speakers, great educational materials, and we even have mentoring opportunities. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.